Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Ichon. In this podcast, Tim and I, a PRI's Director of Communications, and I have a conversation with Tommy Few, a Los Angeles school teacher who, in the aftermath of the Janus decision, wanted to leave his union but couldn't, so he decided to take his case to court. Tommy discusses his lawsuit against the LA Teachers Union, the roadblocks unions and their allies have put in the way of public employees who want to exercise their newly won freedom, and his quest to protect the rights of California teachers. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to PRI's Next Round, Tommy. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So why don't we start at the beginning? Uh, You're a teacher in the LA Unified School District, and you haven't been pleased with how your local union, the United Teachers of Los Angeles, have been spending your union dues each year. So what kinds of union spending have you found objectionable? Well, the, the one area that I use for an example would be this recent gas tax that was on the ballot here in California during our last election. The teachers union actually supported that that tax increase and spent money to obviously get that thing to not pass. And I felt that having my dues money used for something that I might be voting against is not a, an a- equitable use of my money. The other area that I would say, too, is most of the money, from how I understand it, goes to the Democratic Party, and I don't support that particular party. So I'm not in favor of how they spend their money in terms of where it's going. Maybe if they spread it out a little bit more evenly amongst the political parties, it might be a little bit easier to deal with. But it seems a little lopsided, and my money goes against me. So last June, workers like you won a historic victory at the Supreme Court with the Janus decision. So what does that ruling mean to you? And what does it mean for other public employees like you who are concerned about how their union dues are being spent? Uh, the, the ruling for me was actually very exciting because it gave me an opportunity to get out of the union. I had been trying for about three or four months prior to the Janus ruling. So the, the union actually brought it to our attention. It, it wasn't on my radar, so to speak, until they started making waves about it at the school. So I started really paying attention and I didn't realize that I had the opportunity to opt out prior to the Janus ruling. I could have be- I tried to become a fee-paying member, so to speak, prior to Janus. So once it came down, I was really excited to find out that I could get out altogether. And that's when I really started the push to get myself out. My hope for other public employees is that they will take advantage of this newfound information. I I think that not a lot of people really know yet, to be honest with you. It seems like people are just starting to catch on, even though it's been around for, was it six, six, seven, eight months now? Um, I'm hoping that as like cases like mine go forward and the teacher that uh, recently filed in Northridge, I saw an article yesterday with a couple of maybe four teachers up in San Francisco, there was a Washington Times article, that the more this information gets out, the more people will start to understand. And I think that that will benefit everybody in the long run. So Tommy, you know, I'm curious to know uh, what you were told by the unions as far as the Janus decision was what they told you. Do you feel that it was the facts and did they were they uh, did they give you the information straight or did they give their take or their spin on it? Well, obviously they gave their spin on it. They they said things like and and I'm referring to the lady at our at our school is the only contact I had with the union. They they didn't specifically come to our location and as a, as a corporate entity and talk to us, but. They had it all go through the shop steward, so to speak. They basically told us things like, Janice is going to take away your right. Janice is going to break up the union. Janice is going to privatize education. All of all of that kind of stuff was part of the, the propaganda that they were pushing. One of the things that they did do was they came out with what is called a, a one, two, three card, which was a card that was designed to prevent Janice from affecting them. By getting people to recommit to the union, they had assigned these cards. And, and in the small print in these cards, there was uh, what we call entrapment language that actually changed your union date to the date of the new card, uh-huh. which therefore changes the time that, you, that they were saying you could opt out. So it was all kind of a little shady from the get-go on what 
they were doing to try to get us to sign these cards as a as a recommit. When in reality, what it was doing, it was it was changing our our date to be able to uh, opt out if they were to lose that decision. So I don't think the the strategy was upfront with the union members from the get go in terms of what they were doing to try to prevent a ruling that was not contrary to their interests. So after the Janus ruling, you you were keen on exercising your newly won rights, and you tried to stop having dues taken out of your paycheck, but it wasn't so easy. So you you mentioned the experience that you just went through, but what were some of the other roadblocks that UTLA put in the way of your quest to keep your own money in your own pocket? Okay, so, well, as I told you in the prior, I had sent a letter asking to be let out that was sent in May. That was the month before the Janus decision came down. Once the Janice decision ruling came down, I sent in another letter and I also sent one to the LAUSD school district as well to the to the human resources slash payroll people. And those letters were not responded to, actually. So they they ignored those. I sent those certified mail. They were ignored. And in the meantime, I called uh, UTLA membership. And I, I probably called two or three times a week to let them know that I wasn't happy with, with what was going on. And I, I kept getting the same type of answers. Well, you have to wait for your window. Your window is in February. You signed this card in February of 2018, which says, you are willing to give us dues money no matter what your status your status is. So basically just kind of the, the runaround in different language. Same message, uh, different verbiage, and um, that's basically what happened there. So fast forward a couple of months, the strike is coming up. This is probably August or September. It's probably September or August, I would say. And um, uh, the union president, Alex Caputo Pearl, was coming to our campus. He was going to have a uh, rally the troops strike meeting for our particular school and they had a luncheon in the library where they bought everybody sandwiches and what they were doing was they were getting everybody to sign a petition of sorts to put your name on a list that would voice your support for the union strike at that particular location. And what it was, was a way for the union to find out who at the school was supportive and who wasn't. Because now they had your name and if you didn't sign, the other teachers could look at you and say, well, how come you didn't put your name on the list sort of a thing. And what I did at that meeting is I I printed off another letter and I put it in an envelope and I went in and introduced myself to Mr. Caputo Pearl and I told him that I had sent him a couple of certified letters and that I hadn't received a response. And he stuck his hand out and introduced himself to me. And as he put his hand out, I, I slapped another letter in his hand. And I said, I'm pretty sure that you're going to get this one. And he replied, thank you, took my letter. And shortly thereafter, I received another letter saying basically no to my request to get out of the union. And that's about when I came into contact with California Policy Center. So rather than sit back, you decided to uh, take your case to court. And I should say that you you know, we really admire um, people like you have the courage to do this because we know it's difficult. So you did join with our friends at the California Policy Center in filing a lawsuit against uh, the district and the union. Describe for our listeners what you're suing over and what would happen if you won the case. Well, that's that's a great question. Sometimes I, I get a little bit confused about what I'm suing over because it's, it's a little bit more complicated than just giving me my dues money back and letting me out. There's a, there's a couple larger questions that are that are going on in there. Obviously, one is, does the union have a right to continue to take my money based on an arbitrary date on the calendar that they decide, which is what what they're referring to this window or the date of the card that was signed. My date went from 2016 to February 2018 when I signed that card. So that would be the first question. The second question that I have here is that even though the union has responded by releasing me from my membership and they're not taking my dues anymore, they still are claiming a right to my money based on that card. So even though I'm not paying, they are saying that irrespective of my membership status, that they still have access to my money. So if they were to change their mind and you know need my dues money all of a sudden, in their mind, they would still be able to take it. So that would be another question I hope that gets answered. The other question would be, given the fact that Janice came down in our favor and that it was decided that there's a false a false equivalent based on the choice of pay 90 for this or pay 90 for nothing, that I would be able to get my dues money back from day one. So we're also asking for reimbursement on my dues paid till 2016. 
when I when I was actually hired by the district. The other question would be uh, the question of representation. I have asked that the school district allow me to represent myself and my employment me rather than the union doing that for me. I think they refer to it as exclusive bargaining right or bargaining uh, negotiation, exclusive negotiation, I think is what they call it. But they have they have exclusive rights to negotiate on my behalf. So I'm asking that that be removed as well. I would prefer to do that on my own. And I would prefer to you know go in there with my attorney and, and negotiate my employment package rather than have somebody do that for me. And lastly, we are asking that the state have to change their laws to reflect that people have the right to do this for themselves and that there can't be all of this stuff written into the law where the where the state mandates the school district to take the money where the school district then has to give it to the union you know this big circle of how they take your money and it's all it's all written out in law that that one's a little bit more complex but i think that's that's the nuts and bolts of it there and then lastly i hope that if if i was to win in the sense that i could get my dues money back from day one that that would open the door for the unions to have to give back money to people that also would like out of the union and recoup their dues money that they that they've been paying unwillingly so you did have a little bit of good news in your case you did get a little bit of a refund check from the union but it it sounds like if something's too good to be true it probably is so tell us about that you know a little bit of a refund that you got and you got a very interesting letter from utla as well along with that i did actually i was very excited i got a check uh, that was dated back to my first letter, which was sent in June. So they dated back to, but I told you that they, I had sent a letter that they didn't respond to, which was actually my second letter. I sent the first one prior to Janice. They responded, said no. After Janice, I sent a new one, which I never heard back on. However, the check that I received was dated to that first letter. So they, in fact, got the letter because the, the, the check reflected that first, that second letter. The check was for 433 they actually gave me back some interest money and they stopped taking my dues as of December of uh, 2018. Well, you know, you've had other hurdles following the Janus decision. Unions and their allies in the legislature have rushed to put in place all sorts of provisions to make it difficult, as difficult as possible for you to exercise your rights. What are some of these hurdles that you, you and your colleagues have been experiencing since the Janus ruling? Well, one of the, the main hurdles that has been hindering my ability to talk to my coworkers about this is obviously the fact that I'm not allowed to do it on the campus is one one place where I'm I'm handcuffed, so to speak. But a lot of a lot of the teachers are scared. They are worried that they are not going to get their uh, retro checks. They are, you know, the strike that just came on. Everybody is going to get a little back pay from 2017. And teachers that are interested in opting out are not willing to opt out, so to speak, because they're they're fearful that their paychecks will be not reflecting what they think they've earned in the strike. So so that's the biggest thing. And then the other thing I don't know that is, is built into the legislator or the law, so to speak, but it's the peer pressure to conform. I'm the only one at my school that chose to take this step. And it, it was hard because a lot of the teachers were, were angry with me. They were showing the YouTube video and the union meetings, and they were trying to make me out as this bad guy. And there's still people that won't talk to me. So, so from that perspective, it's been difficult. However, now that the strike is over and they have it's all been concluded a lot of the teachers have determined that this wasn't probably the best choice for them because they lost x amount of dollars to strike and basically what's going to happen is anything they got in the raise is going to go to cover those six or seven days that they missed so it's it's basically a wash so in hindsight some of them have actually come to me and said you made the better choice so so even with all the pressure and all of the stigma that was associated with my choice i've been told that it was probably the better choice by union members and they've actually have given me kudos for taking that step and, and being courageous so to speak to stand up to it despite the pressure that I was facing from the co-workers and the administration and other people that weren't favorable to to my choice so what are the next steps for your lawsuit have you been able to read any legal tea leaves here you know what do you think are the prospects for victory in your case 
Well, it's interesting. I was talking to a lady today that is um, have found me on the internet that wants to opt out. She is a LAUSD employee, and we were having this exact conversation this afternoon. And given the political leanings of Southern California and, and the tendency to be towards the progressive liberal side, if I were to make a prediction, I would say we would probably lose at the local level just based on the politics of the area. Now, do I want that? Absolutely not. My thought is that as we get higher up in the court system, as it works its way up, we will probably see more favorable decisions. Um, I'm not convinced at this level or even the Ninth Circuit level, if it were to make it that far, that we would we would come out favorable. Uh, now, my hope is, is that with the Janus being the new precedent, that skepticism on my part would would not not bear fruit, so to speak. But we would see an even handed ruling based on precedent. So, so that would be my hope. Well, Tommy, for our last question, um, you might know that PRI is uh, in San Francisco next door to wine country, and we all enjoy an adult beverage at our think tank. And our last question is always to ask our guests if they could recommend a wine or, or beer or cocktail recommendation. We know you got a long road ahead with your suit, and we wish you all the best. You got a little refund, so what are you doing to celebrate that? What are you drinking? Well, what I can tell you is that I'm not a big drinker, but what I have been doing is I've been training for my first marathon. So I've been using some of that extra money to buy equipment. I paid for my uh, marathon fees. I bought some new running shoes. I bought some equipment, some clothes, that kind of stuff. And uh, so that's pretty exciting for me. I'm going to be 54 here and I've never, I've never uh, accomplished that task. So that's, that's what I've been working on for about the last three or four months. And if I could give a plug to uh, Ventura, where I live, there are some nice establishments where my wife and I like to go and enjoy an adult beverage of sorts here in town. So that that would be good, too, as well. If you would like to uh, come to Ventura, that's always a fun place to come. Sure. And, and what are those um, What are those places? We love Ventura. Uh, one of the places that we like to go, our favorite place, we just celebrated our 16th wedding, wedding anniversary, is called Lure. It's a seafood restaurant on California Street, and they have probably the best seafood in town. And we like to sit at the bar and, and have a, uh, my wife likes to have a uh, strawberry and basil drink that they make by, by scratch. And I usually have a mineral water and we enjoy each other and have a good meal. And the name of the place is Lure. L-U-R-E. Very good restaurant. Well, we wish you all the best. Thanks so much, Tommy. You're welcome. Special thanks to Tommy Few and to my co-host, Tim Anaya. And if you're interested in our work on the Janus decision, visit PRI's website at pacificresearch.org. If you're working on your vacation plans, consider mixing policy and cruising. Join PRI and the Claremont Institute for our 40th anniversary cruise on the Mediterranean. The cruise starts in Barcelona and ends in Rome with a special tour of the Vatican. Special guests include Andrew Roberts, author of Churchill, Walking with Destiny, and Charles Kessler, editor of the Claremont Review of Books, and of course, our own Sally Pipes. For more details, visit ci-pri.com. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.